Welcome to the 12th lecture of the Digital Image Processing course. In this lecture, I will give you a brief introduction to image compression and watermarking. So the topic that will be covered in this lecture are image compression fundamentals, uh, definitions of different types of redundancies that we can have in image data, how we can measure the amount of information in an image, then I will talk about uh, fidelity criteria that is commonly used for comparing the result of image compression to the original images. Finally, uh, a brief overview of the image compression models, image coding, and watermarking. So let's just begin with the fundamentals. So data compression is the process of reducing the amount of data that is required to present a certain uh, amount of information. So based on this definition, you can easily see that the data and information are not the same in this context. Data is serving as means for conveying uh, information. So because of that, you can have various amount of data to represent the exact same amount of information. So since we have this, uh, we may end up having redundancy if uh, irrelevant or repeated data is being used to convey a certain amount of information. So to quantify the amount of redundancy, let's just take a look at some definitions. So assuming B and B prime as the number of bits that are used for representing the same amount of information using two uh, different techniques. So the relative data redundancy, here we call it R, with b bits uh, it calculated using this simple equation r equals 1 minus 1 over c and in this equation c is known as the compression ratio which is the ratio between b and b prime so in image processing b is the total number of bits that is used to represent an array of intensity values so let's say if you're working with a 100 by 100 pixel image and each Im each pixel is represented by 8 bits so in total uh, b becomes uh, 100 multiplied by 100 multiplied by 8 or 80,000 bits so as i said depending on the system that we use for compression or representing the information we may end up having redundancies so there are three types of redundancies common in images. We can have coding redundancy, which is caused by more than necessary bits in the code words that are used for representing images. So let's say if you have uh, an array of values, a 2D array of values for which the range of the values can change between 0 and 255. So in this case, if you have all the possible uh, intensity values, only having 8 bits to represent um, the intensity information is enough. But if you uh, use code words that are 16 bits, uh, you are using more than necessary bits to represent the image. So that is an example of coding redundancy. We can have a spatial and temporal redundancy which is caused by the correlations between pixels of an image or a sequence of images cause that causes unnecessary replication of information. So let's say you are working uh, with a video in which most of the objects in the scene are, uh, are fixed and not moving. So this is an example of having temporal redundancy. So if you want to store this data uh, you only need one copy of the object that are uh, not moving so that can help you reduce um, the amount of redundancy in your data and then finally we can have irrelevant information which is information that is irrelevant to the features of our interest so here you can see three different examples uh, each containing uh, one of these redundancies we have this one uh, which has uh, coding redundancy, we have, we have this one which has uh, spatial redundancy, and finally we have this image which you can say uh, 
contains irrelevant information. So let's just go into more detail and see how these images contain these uh, different types of redundancy. So before we do that, uh, let's just go over some definitions for coding redundancy. So we start by the definition of the normalized histogram. So by by this point, you have seen this definition many, many times. So assume a random variable or k in the interval 0 and L minus 1 is used to represent the intensity levels of an M by N image. So based on this, the normalized histogram can be shown using this equation, PR of RK equals NK over M multiplied by N, in which K ch can change between 0 and L minus 1. So here, PR is the probability of intensity value RK. NK is the number of times that this intensity value RK appears in the image. And the denominator is M by N, which is the total number of pixels in that image. So now let's just say uh, we use a separate function L of RK to represent the number of bits that is used for representing each value of RK. So based on this new function, the average number of bits that is required to represent each pixel in the image can be calculated using this equation. So we have capital L average, the average number of bits over the entire image, equals uh, the summation of LRK multiplied by PRK, basically the number of bits per pixel multiplied by the probability. So number of bits per intensity level and multiplied by the probability of that intensity level. And this summation is calculated for values of k changing from 0 to L minus 1. So up until now what we had before was L of rk to be a fixed value. So if you were working with an 8-bit image, L of rk is a constant 8. But this is not necessarily the case always. So you can have um, different coding techniques that use variable length for representing different uh, intensity values. So now let's just take a look at one example and see how this calculation uh, can show the amount of redundancy that we can have in an image, spe uh, specifically coding redundancy. So the image on the left, as you can see, is a 256 by 256 8-bit uh, uh, grayscale image. But if you look closely, you see that there are only four different intensity values that are present in this image. So we have 87, we have 128, we have 186, and we have 255. So out of the um, 256 possible intensity level that you can show with 8 bits, only four of them are present here. If we calculate the normalized histogram, these are the probabilities of each one of these uh, intensity levels in the image. So now let's just compare two cases. One, if we use an, uh, a fixed length code uh, with length 8, here we call it code 1. And as you can see, we can have different uh, representations of the intensity value. So clearly this is not wrong, this is only for, uh, for sample, but each one of these intensity values is shown with an 8-bit code. And here, as you can see, the number of bits per intensity level is uh, 8 bits. The second case is if you are using a variable length code. So here, as you can see, for representing intensity level 87, uh, 87 we use code 01. For 128, we use 1. For 186, we use 3. And for 250, Five, we also use uh, three uh, bits to represent this intensity level. And based on this, we have L2 to be 2, 1, 3, and 3. So now if we use the equation for L average, we see that for code 1, the average number of bits that is required, uh, that is used for representing this image 
is 8 bits while for the second code the average number of bits is 1.81 so now based on this if we want to calculate the compression ratio and the relative data redundancy uh, that we have between these two representation we can simply use the equation for uh, for C which was the total number of bits for one representation divided by the total number of bits for the other representation so usually it is the the num largest number of bits is on on the numerator and the smallest one is on the denominator so for code 1 it's going to be m by n by 8 and for code 2 it's going to be m by n by 1.81 so if we do this calculation this is approximately 4.42 and based on this if we calculate the relative data redundancy we have the data relative data redundancy to be 0 0.774 which means that 77.4% of the data uh, in the original 8-bit representation uh, is redundant. So now let's take a look at another example to see how a spatial and temporal redundancies work. So on the left we have a 256 by 256 image and we are using 8 bits to represent all these intensity values. If we draw the histogram of this uh, specific image, we see that all the intensity values have exactly the same uh, probabilities. So since all the 2256 intensity levels have identical probabilities to represent and preserve all the information in the image, we need to have 8 bits to represent all the intensity values. However, we see that all the pixels in the same row of the image have identical intensity values and that is an example of a spatial redundancy so a better way to represent such image is by using a sequence of run length pairs in which you specify the start of a new intensity value uh, paired with the number of consecutive pixels that have that intensity value so if you do this, this image 256 by 256 can be only represented by a 256 by 2 uh, matrix. So here, this can be done by replacing each row with a single 8-bit intensity value and the length of 256 as the length of the row. So this, uh, this way you can see how you can compress the information that is uh, in this image uh, in such a way that you end up with much less uh, number of bits to be used for the representation of that information. What about irrelevant information? So the image on the left is um, mostly uh, gray, right? So and just by looking at this image you don't see any uh, variations in the intensity but if we create the normalized histogram for this image we realize that we actually have some variations in the intensity even though all of them are uh, happening almost in the middle of the intensity ranges so to see what other information are present in this image we can do one of the techniques that we have designed before for uh, improving the histogram so if we apply histogram equalization on this image this is the uh, the result of the histogram equalization so the original uh, image appears as a homogeneous field of gray to the human visual system that can be represented even by a single 8-bit value so you can just say uh, I have an image of this size and the intensity values for all the pixels is let's say 125. On the other hand the histogram equalized version shows some patterns that are not visible in the original image. So now the question becomes are, are these additional information that you see in the histogram equalized image are irrelevant information or not? Because if they are irrelevant information 
and you can represent this image by the uh, average of all of its intensity values then you can uh, heavily reduce the the amount of data that you use for representing this image but if you say no these very fine patterns are also important in that case you cannot have any sort of compression and you need to uh, represent all the uh, intensity values so whether the image can be represented by a single value or as a whole without any compression depends on the specific application for example if you are working with uh, medical images usually you need to preserve all the information that you have so you cannot afford to uh, lose uh, any information but for let's say for representation purposes for visualization purposes if you only want to visualize this you can see that you can only use one intensity value one value to represent this uh, this whole image so depending on the application you it, you can uh, consider some of the information to be relevant or relevant so now that we have talked about this how can we measure the amount of information in an image the answer is in the concept from information theory so if you have a random event here we call it E that has a probability of happening here we call it P of E we say that this random event contains I of E units of information so how is this calculated simply by calculating this equation of course the main idea behind driving this equation is not going to be covered in this course so if you are interested you can uh, refer to uh, more relevant courses on information theory so I of E equals log of 1 over the probability of E or minus log of probability of E so what do we get from this uh, equation so if P of E is 1 which means that the probability of this event happening is 100% then um, the amount of information contained in this random event is 0 based on this equation so that means that the less probable is an event the more amount of information uh, you can have or in another word uh, the more random an event is the more information that it has so now let's just assume we have a sequence of independent random events here we call them a1 to aj and each one of them has its own probability of happening p a1 p a2 all the way to p a j so now based on this we can define what is called to be entropy of the sources of these random events and it is defined as h equals negative summation of p a j multiplied by log of p a j and this summation is calculated for j changing from 1 to j so the entropy you can say it is equivalent to the amount of information for these series of events so if you are working with an image with intensity levels rk and probabilities p r of rk and since we are working with binary values uh, this log is changed to log 2 we can uh, calculate the entropy uh, of the the image or equivalently the amount of information in that image by this equation so h tilde equals negative the summation over k changing from 0 to l minus 1 basically over the total number of intensity values prk the probability of each intensity value multiplied by log 2 of prk which in essence is the lower bound on the compression that can be achieved when coding uh, statistically independent pixels directly so what do we mean by that the meaning is that we assume that all the pixels are independent of each other this is not necessarily the case for the image data but it is a good enough estimate that we can use for our calculations when we want to compress images 
So now let's see what is the amount of ent entropy in the image that we have seen before. For these three images, uh, if we calculate the entropies, for the first one, the entropy is 1.664. For the second one, the entropy is 8. And for the last one, the entropy is 1.566 bits per pixel, respectively. So again, remember that the entropy is a lower bound on the compression that can be achieved when coding a statistically independent pixels directly. So in the images, this is not usually the case. Why? Because uh, we, can, uh, we can have spatial and temporal correlations between the pixels as well, right? And the general definition for entropy uh, is uh, not considering those spatial and uh, temporal correlations that we have between uh, pixels. But in any case, the amount of entropy and the information in an image, they are uh, correlating with each other, even though this correlation may not be intuitive. So now let's just quickly go over uh, the uh, fidelity criteria that we usually use for comparing the performance of image compression algorithms. So compression may cause loss of information so there are generally two types of criteria that can be used for assessing the performance of compression algorithms. We can have objective uh, metrics in which we have a mathematical expression that shows the amount of error between the original image and its compressed version. So for example, we can r use root mean squared error, the first equation, or we can use mean squared signal to noise ratio the second equation. So as you can see the derivation of these equations is pretty straightforward. For the ERMS we calculate the difference between the compressed image and the original image for each pixel. We take it to the power 2, calculate the summation and we take the average and we calculate the square root of this value. As for the signal to noise ratio the denominator is a good estimate of the noise or the difference between the original image and the compressed version and in the numerator we have uh, basically the the power of the uh, of the image so we are calculating the uh, the ratio between the power of the image and the power of the difference or uh, noise the other type of metric that we can use is uh, the class of subjective metrics in which uh, humans basically ju judge the performance of uh, different compression algorithms. So now let's take a look at one example. So here on the left we have the original uh, image without any compression and then we have the result of three compression image compression algorithm and we want to compare the uh, the performance so we can calculate the root mean square error or RMS error and if we do that the first result has an RMS of 5.717 the second has an RMS of 15.67 and finally we have the last one which has an RMS of 14.17 uh, uh, of course, uh, using RMS by itself is not uh, not enough. And uh, if we, uh, for example, compare these results uh, subjectively, you see that the last one is probably the less truthful to the original image because there are several sections of the image that are uh, completely eliminated, even though the RMS is less than the uh, the second one. So for subjective compression, you can usually devise a table such as the following example and ask uh, human observers to compare the results of a uh, different compression algorithm. So this uh, table is an example of a rating scale that is used uh, to uh, quantify the, the quality of pictures that appear on, uh, on TV, for example. Now let's quickly go over uh, 
uh, image compression models. So an image compression system usually consists of two main components. We have an encoder component and a decoder component. The encoder component performs compression and the decoder component performs decompression. So a codec is a device or program that is capable of both encoding and decoding. Also, you probably have heard about this, a compression system can be either lossless or information preserving or it can be uh, lossy. So as you can see from this image, each one of these components, the encoder or decoder have uh, some components within them. So the input to this system is the image f of x, y, or it can be a sequence of images like a movie, uh, which is shown by three variables f of x, y, and t. And the output is f, f hat x, y, or f hat x, y, and t. So the result of the encoder will be the compressed data that is used for storage and transmission. So now let's take a better look at the individual components that we have in this system. So at the beginning we have the mapper which transforms the input data into a usually non-visual format that is designed to reduce spatial and temporal redundancy. So this operation is generally reversible. Then we have the quantizer which reduces the accuracy of the mapper's output in accordance with some pre-established fidelity criterion. For example, with uh, less amount of RMS error or with less amount of signal to noise ratio. And this is to keep irrelevant information out of the compression, compressed uh, representation. So this operation is lossy and generally it is non-reversible. So if you plan to have an error-free compression, uh, you should uh, remove this, uh, this step. So, so far we have seen the mapper, which is generally used for reducing spatial and temporal redundancy. Then we saw quantizer, which is generally used to uh, reduce irrelevant information in the compression results. And then finally we have symbol, uh, symbol encoder, which generates a fixed or a variable length code to represent the quantizer output. And this operation is, uh, is reversible. So mapper is for reducing spatial temporal redundancy, quantizer is for reducing irrelevant information, and symbol encoder is generally for uh, reducing coding redundancy. So now in the decoder part, we have uh, the symbol decoder and the inverse mapper that perform the inverse operations of the encoder, symbol encoder, and mapper rep respectively. So as you can see, since the quantizer is generally non-reversible, we don't have any uh, equivalent component in the, uh, in the decoder. So in th when we talk about images, there are some definitions that we need to consider. We have the definition of image format which is a standard way to organize and store image data. We can have image container, which is similar to a, an image format, but usually handles multiple types of image data. And finally, we can have image compression standard, which defines all the procedures for compressing and decompressing images and uh, basically reducing the amount of redundancy that we have in the original images. So here you see a general chart of different uh, image formats that are currently in use. So we have two cases, one for still images, one for videos or sequences of images. As for still images, we can even either have a binary image, zero and one, black and white image, or we can have a continuous tone or grayscale image. As you can see, some of these techniques are colored in blue, while some of them are colored in black. So the blue ones are the formats and containers that are internationally sanctioned, um, while the one in black, they are not inter internationally sanctioned, but still they are widely, uh, widely used. So here you see 
the previous chart in much more detail we have different uh, standard uh, internationally sanctioned standard for by level or binary images we have uh, JPEG for example which is probably the most well-known technique out of these which is uh, short for joint photographic expert group standard which uses um, discrete cosine transform as, the, as one of the main building blocks for uh, doing the compression there are more advanced versions of it as well so JPEG by itself is lossy but we have JPEG LS which is a lossless to near lossless standard uh, basically improves the performance of JPEG and finally we have J JPEG 2000 which is again a follow-up on the JPEG uh, standard for increased compression of uh, JPEG images it uses uh, different uh, coding algorithms and also it uses discrete wavelet transform instead of discrete cosine transform that was used in original JPEG as for the internationally sanctioned video compression standard you have probably seen some of these so we have MPEG-4 we have uh, H.263 uh, and all of these if you are interested you can refer to the uh, corresponding sections in the in the book for example DV is mentioned in uh, section 8.9 or MPEG-4 is mentioned in uh, section 8.10 so if you are interested you can follow up on that by referring to the book or any other material that uh, covers these type of techniques and finally we have a more detailed version of the chart for uh, popular image and video compression standards so these are not necessarily internationally sanctioned but as you probably can detect from their names they are widely uh, popular we can have BMP we can have GIF which is short for graphic interchange format we can have PDF, PNG, TIFF WebP and we have some techniques for video uh, compression uh, as well so there are some common image coding methods that are widely popular and they are covered in the book I'm not gonna go over them individually uh, because this lecture was only for a brief introduction to the basic concepts of image compression so we can have Hoffman uh, coding which is a version of uh, variable length coding we ha can have more advanced version Golem and arithmetic coding LZW coding uh, we can have run length coding you have seen one example at the beginning uh, that we can use the, the starting position of an intensity level and the the duration or the number of pixels that that uh, intensity level is repeated so that is a basic example of a run length coding as for the symbol based uh, coding you can think of it as a technique that is used for compressing uh, binary images mainly uh, scan text uh, document we can have bit plane coding if you remember from the first few lectures we said that we can divide uh, our images into uh, different bit planes based on the the weight of the binary weight of each one of these uh, bits in the image so that is one possibility that you can use to compress your images we can have block transform coding in which uh, we divide our image into smaller blocks and we use some sort of discrete Fourier transform discrete cosine transform or discrete wavelet transform to uh, find the appropriate coefficients and use those for quantization and reducing uh, their redundancy and we can have predictive coding and more advanced wavelet coding uh, for uh, com compressing video files uh, as well so now that we have seen different uh, 
image compression algorithm at least we had a better idea about general uh, concept behind image compression it's only natural to talk about image watermarking too so image watermarking is the process of inserting data into an image and this is a common technique that is used for copyright identification user identification authenticity determination automated monitoring and copy protection so in general we can have two different types of watermarks they can be either visible in which we have an opaque or semi-transparent sub image that is placed on top of another image or they can be invisible in which the watermark cannot be seen by the naked eye but if you have appropriate decoding algorithm you can recover or extract the watermark there is an uh, there is another way of uh, classifying different watermarking techniques uh, they can either be fragile in which the watermark is destroyed when the image is modified or they can be robust uh, in which watermark sur uh, survives image mod modification so let's just take a look at two very basic um, techniques for uh, image watermarking so the first one is uh, the very basic image watermarking that uh, is uh, achieved by applying this equation so we have f of fw which is the watermark image we have f which is the original image and finally we have w which is the watermark image and what you can do is that you basically calculate the weighted summation of the original image and the watermark so how are these weights are determined by this uh, parameter alpha so alpha is a constant that controls the relative visibility of the watermark and the underlying image as you can see we have uh, 1 minus alpha multiplied by f and alpha multiplied by w so alpha has a is a value is a constant value between 0 uh, and 1 so if alpha is 1 that means that fw is only going to be watermark if alpha is 0 that means fw is going to be only f anything in between we have different uh, ratios of uh, f and w combined to create uh, fw so let's just say we want to add this watermark into the lena's image for starters you should know that to for this arithmetic calculation to be valid uh, you need to have both f and w having exactly the same size so if your watermark is uh, smaller than the original image you need to add uh, basically you need to zero pad it but in any case after that is done uh, this is the the watermark image and if you calculate the difference between this image and the original image you can have a good estimate of the uh, the watermark uh, watermark is itself so that is one example of simple image watermarking and this as you can see uh, results in a visible watermark so now let's uh, take a look at another example here we have an example of an invisible fragile watermark that is generated by the following equation so we have fw multiplied by uh, equals 4 multiplied by f mul divided by 4 plus w divided by 64 so the first time that you look at this equation you may think that okay why do we divide f by 4 only to multiply it by 4 what difference does it make so one thing that you should notice is that these uh, multiplications and division are all done using uh, unsigned integer arithmetic so that means that we uh, if let's say we divide uh, an intensity value 10 divided by 4 we don't get 2.5 since we are working with integer arithmetic we get 2 right so dividing and multiplying by 0 sets the two least significant bits of f to 0 dividing w by 64 shift its two most significant bits into the two least significant bits position so now if you uh, add these two together you generate what is called to be 
the least significant bit or LSP watermarked image. So this one, this original image, and this is the watermark that we want to apply. So this is the result. So even though you don't see the uh, the watermark image, but you should realize that just by applying this simple equation using unsigned integer arithmetic, what we uh, what we have done is that we basically eliminated the least two significant bits of the original image and we replaced those two significant uh, least significant bits with the watermark image so this is basically what you see here this is the watermarked image even though you are not able to see the the, the watermark itself but why do we say this is a an example of a fragile watermark. The reason for that is that if you apply uh, JPEG compression on this image uh, and then try to extract the watermark, this is basically what you get. Why? Because JPEG compression uh, eliminates some of the uh, unnecessarily unnecessary information in the uh, in the image. Of course, there is no way for the for the JPEG compression to know that we have uh, added a, a watermark, an invisible watermark to the to the image. So, because there is no distinction in JPEG compression, uh, it basically eliminates those information associated with the watermark as mm, non-necessary uh, information. So these were only two basic techniques. Uh, if you are more interested on the other technique more uh, robust techniques for watermarking uh, feel free to look online and refer to uh, appropriate uh, documents and papers that discuss these techniques so by this i conclude the uh, last lecture of the digital image processing course so during this course we have learned uh, so much we have started with basic intensity transformations and then we move to different techniques for uh, spatial filtering we extensively talked about fast Fourier transform how it's calculated for uh, for discrete or digital images what are those properties and how we can apply filters in the Fourier domain then we move to image restoration we talked about noise reduction we talked about different types of degradation that can happen in the images uh, we discussed extensively on the topics of edge detection uh, image thresholding and segmentation we talked about color image processing and finally for the last lecture uh, we talked about introduction to image compression and watermarking so from now on you should have a good foundation on uh, different areas of image processing of course we only uh, barely basically scratch the surface so there are definitely more for you to learn but you should have a good foundation to uh, start learning on your own write your own code and experiment with image processing libraries that uh, you see so good luck image processing